but um, so this is the second of the three game Anglia talks that Chris has um, kindly organised for us. Yes. And um, yes, and um, and just to introduce to those who don't know, Chris Philly um, is an ex grad of ours, alumni, not an ex grad, yeah. an alumni of ours. You graduated in 2014. 14. Wow. 2014 and since then you've worked at Ubisoft and now you're back that was Ubisoft in Romania now Chris is back in the UK and he works over the road at a, a high-tech startup company called Conga and um, Chris is going to be talking to you today about branding I believe with specific reference to games I'm assuming yes yes to you as game developers and you as game exactly. developers so um, well welcome Chris and um, thank you very much thank you go. Right. so thanks for the introduction Rob let me just blank the screen <laughs> um, okay As Rob mentioned, my name is Chris. I'm one of the organizers for Game Anglia, and I also work with Conga at the moment. And I'm here to talk to you about branding. Now, let's just start with uh, with some audience participation from a very engaged audience such as yourselves. What do you think about when you think branding? When you hear branding, what are the things that you think about? Trademark. Trademark, okay, yeah, that's a legal process. What else? What people say about it, when it's going on the room. Okay, what people uh, talk about the company or the product when you're not in the room. What else? Logos. Yeah, logos. Aspects you associate with the company or the product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What about the name? Is the name part of branding? Yeah. Okay. Good. Keep that in mind because we're going to be talking about that in a sec. So my background is <coughs> that I've been branding since 2010 when I first started organizing projects, and we were like, mm, we need a name for this for this thing, and we need a Facebook avatar because people need to find to find us. Um, I worked on English and Romanian projects, so I have a bit of experience with. Uh, with branding in, in both of these languages, so branding internationally and branding for a very specific audience. I've worked with quite a bit of, well, quite a few branding documents due to our partners. So this is the first project that I created, which was called Banda Photo. That's Romanian for the photo band. We were creating uh, creative photography events uh, down in Bucharest in Romania. And as part of those events, we were working with sponsors and partners such as Pepsi, such as Orange, um, and they have brand what they call branding manuals. These are 40-page documents which tell you how you should use their brand, where you should use their, their brand, and they actually give you all of the resources and, and use cases for that. We're not going to look into that nowadays. Uh, nowadays, at during this presentation. But that's something to keep in mind. If you ever work with, with a big partner, they, they will have a branding document. And we're going to go into that a little bit further when we look at, well, exactly when I make a logo, what do I need to think about? I then, uh, I then started an initiative with a friend, uh, again in Romania, called Almost a Hero. We hope to help unite, unify uh, high school level and college level education throughout Eastern Europe under a curriculum provide the, uh, a framework for that uh, because we uh, the, the landscape is completely different from, from the UK at the moment um, I'm organizing an event uh, for uh, companies who want to place it with Qatar and of course right there in the bottom I'm one of the organizers for Game Anglia and all of the branding that you see in this document is done by our amazing graphic designer Jason so what are we going to be covering today? What is branding? We're going to be answering that. We're going to talk about branding yourselves, branding your company, your game, and then we're going to have a look at some best practices. So things like, hmm, should I care about how my name sounds in English and why? <laughs> so what is branding and what's covered by branding? Right. The way that I look at it is the totality of messages spread through any mediums about your company or product. So let's have a think about what those mediums might be. A 
stuff. You know, football, we've got the internet, television, yeah. radio, okay. word of mouth. That's actually interesting. So what is going to be fundamentally different between television and radio? Visual and audio? Yeah. Visual and audio? Yeah, exactly. So TV is audiovisual, whereas radio is just visual. Oh, uh, it's just <laughs> audio. Um, and when you look at the internet, when we browse on our phones, most of us have audio turned off because we're browsing during lectures, right? So <laughs> sometimes the internet is more just visual rather than audio. So those mediums could be visual, right? Does everybody recognize that logo? OK, they could be text. Every little helps. Where's that from? That's right. Tesco's. Yeah, exactly. And we also have audio. If this decides to collaborate. Uh, uh, so what's that from? Oh no. oh no. I <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So all of these things you need to take into account when you're setting up your branding. Right, you need to think about these. For example, um, <coughs> game Anglia, right? That's something that could be that can be easily pronounced, and we're going to go into that in a sec. But first, let's talk about yourself. You are a product. The person that you are <coughs> in your professional life is usually going to be different from the person that you are in your personal life, right? So, who here has a Twitter account? Okay. Who doesn't have a Twitter account? Okay, you should have a Twitter account again. Go and make one after this. Okay. <laughs> because in the Western world, right, so that's Western Europe plus the US plus Canada, most people use Twitter in the games industry to create a conversation. Right. And you need to curate what your Twitter is going to be about and what your social feeds are going to be about. Because you want to target that to the right audience. You want to follow the people who are going to uh, who you want to follow, or your target audience. So if you're looking for a job, you might be looking at big companies, or recruiters, or people who, uh, who are always looking for collaborators, right? If you're looking for an artist for your game, you might start following hashtags for like art versus artist, and figure out what your best, uh, your, what your best um, collaboration would be with somebody who creates art in the art style that you want for your game. So think about what the purpose of each social media channel is, and don't invest in social media channels that you can't uh, that you can't man. For example, for Game Anglia, we have a Twitter which is really active. We have about one or two tweets a day. Uh, we have an Instagram feed which hasn't been updated since November 2018 to 2017, and we have a Facebook feed which has maybe one post a week. Most of those are cross-posted from from Twitter. So think about where you're going to be active because you only have so many hours in the day and you, your attention can be in only so many places. For me personally, what's really important is Twitter. So this is how I look like on Twitter. You can see my name there in English. You get to see my, uh, my username and you can see a description. So if you look at this, what do I do? What would you say that I do? Your game designer. Okay, cool. Am I interested in anything else? So one of those things is guest lecture, which is why I'm, which allows me to then go to Rob and say, hey Rob, you know my Twitter feed, my Twitter description says that I'm, I like giving lectures. Can I give a lecture to your to, to your students? And I've been giving lectures up and down stuff uh, these have been for a while now. What's again really important for me is my uh, LinkedIn page. So this is how that looks like. You can see there I have both my Romanian and my English name. So that's my full name. Um, and I have the project I'm currently involved with, which is Game Anglia, and uh, my university, which was this university where I graduated from, and my location. And I then have my Facebook. Now, with your Facebook, it's really important to think about your privacy settings, right? Because what you post on Facebook might be random stuff from 9 that you don't really want your, your future employers to find out. So this is how my Facebook looks like, my Facebook profile looks like, uh, for anybody who's not a friend of mine right, on Facebook. And I make it a priority for me not to make friends on Facebook with people I work with and people who pay me. Because what might happen is 
as soon as I post something like this, they're going to be like, Chris, what the fuck have you been up to? So think about how your public identity looks like and make sure that it's consistent. Because you yourself are a product and you need to make sure that your branding is on point. Again, um, you don't want your future employers to see that part of you. Now this might be different if you're a freelancer and you work very <coughs> well, like if you're an artist or if you're, um, or if you're a sound designer and you work really closely with your friends and your friends are your clients and your clients are your friends. Uh, this is going to look completely different for, differently for somebody who sells, sells Herbalife, right? Or Ava, because they want their personal identity to also be their professional identity. And they might not, they might not even have a LinkedIn or, or a Twitter, they might just have Facebook, because that's where their clients are. So again, think about your purpose, your target audience, and uh, what you want to get out of get out of this. It might be that you want followers, right? I mean, I, I think I made about 100 followers during GDC, which is really nice. Now, when thinking about how to brand yourself, that's my full name. You pronounce it Radesh Christian Kiritsa Filip, for the uh, very few of you who are Romanian. Now, there's a reason <laughs> why I introduce myself as Chris Phil. That's because when I first meet somebody, I don't want to spend the first five minutes talking about why my parents decided, decided to give me um, a Romanian name. I want to talk about my product or I want to talk about my projects or myself, not about my name in particular. <coughs> so you need to think about that. Who are you talking to and in what country? Who here doesn't have an English sounding name? Okay. So one thing that I saw last year with one of the students was we had a student called Trakos who decided to rebrand himself as Drake because it was really easy to pronounce. Right? In your case, um, your full name is? Kirill. And, and you introduce yourself as? Kai. Kai, right? Because that's easy. Yeah. So again, think about what you want the first 30 seconds of an interaction to be, uh, to be about. Is it about I'm sorry, what is that drag? What? <laughs> or is it just like, oh, hi, Drake, I'm, you know, uh, Richard or whatever. And think about what language you want to talk in. Or what language is your target audience going to talk in? So this is a business card that I got uh, from a guy called Vlad Miku. He's in Amsterdam at the moment, I think. Um, and he's a really interesting person. The, the thing is, he does business internationally. So that's the front of his business card, right? Uh, he has his name there, he has his all of his contact details, but then when you look at the back of his card, it's the same thing, but with Japanese characters, because he also does business in Jap uh, Japan. This is how my business card looks like. And you can see there that I, again, just like on LinkedIn, I have my full name. That's because I travel a lot between Romania and England, or Romania and English-speaking countries. And I want people from English-speaking countries to call me Chris Philip, and that's how I'll introduce myself. I want everybody else to call me Radish Kinitsa because that's how, uh, because it's really easy for them to pronounce that. Another thing to think about is um, your email address. So the thing that I did before I went to GDC was I went and bought a, a domain. Because my Gmail address um, is basically very Romanian, right? I got it a, a long time ago. And I haven't been able to change it to Chris Philip. All of, all of the variations that you can think about for Chris Philip are taken. Um, so I then went uh, and looked for uh, various domains, and I managed to get philip.studio. That's a novelty domain, but it, in, in our industry, a lot of people have novelty domains either for their games or for their companies or for themselves. So I made myself an email address, which is just like chris at philip.studio. And I also have one, uh, which is rubbish at philip.studio. Because I want that to be easy for people to read and to recognize. So who here has an email address that's easy to pronounce, like a Gmail address or a custom email address? Does anybody have a custom email address, which is in Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, AOL? Yeah. But it's related to my like online handle, so it doesn't really count, I guess? Which no. It's like, like, like my variant is not really aimed at um, game design in general. It's mm -hmm. just something I made up. So what's it called? <coughs> 
it's uh, pi x. Okay. So it's easy to pronounce, right? Mm-hmm. So does, uh, does that sound like somebody who makes frying pans? You have no idea what it is, right? That's exactly, and yeah. that's and that's really good. So it th it's not necessarily related to you making games, but it's not unrelated to you making games either, which means you can use it however you want. And I have a friend, um, game developer from Oni, named Cell. Right, that's that's the, the pseudonym that, that 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 he goes by. And again, it's like, does he make games? Who knows? We're going to have to find out. But again, I, just as you mentioned, it's really easy to introduce to yourself. Here. Um, <coughs> And one thing that um, there's going to be a recurring theme is think about what your Twitter handle is going to be, think about what your social media handles are going to be, think about what you, your domain is going to be, and just as yourself, don't worry if it's going to be legacy, it happens. So my Wiz Radish thing, that's something that I coined one back when I was, I think, 14, something along those lines, and I've just been kicking it forward, kicking it, uh, kicking it, kicking it forward. And at the moment, so many people follow me on that um, on that handle, either on Instagram or on Twitter, uh, that I really don't care about changing it. It's like, yeah, ju that's just it, it. Deal with it. I'm not going to change it to Chris Philip Games or something like that. So again, all of these have um, all of these rules um, have exceptions. Another thing that I'd like to say here is my, the way that I write in my name is specifically for English speaking and Romanian speaking or Slavic countries. I have not taken into account and probably won't take into account anytime soon uh, Asian countries. So in Japanese, every time I try to introduce myself to a Japanese person, I had issues because neither Radesh nor Chris uh, are easy to pronounce in Japanese. So I'm either Rareshi, which um, can be quite hard to say and is spelled slightly weirdly, or Kurisu. Right? <laughs> So I need to be careful about that, but I don't plan on, on making use of that anytime soon. Now in terms of branding your company, so again, you have one name, you will most likely have more than one company during your life. What do you need to think about when you brand your company? First, make sure that it's easy to pronounce. And that means to type, to say, to understand, to remember, for example, this is what we initially decided to call Game Anglia. It was East of England Game Developers Conference. Not to mention all of the infringement on the Game Developers Conference. It was a <laughs> mouthful, so we decided to get that domain. Now, whenever I tell people, oh yeah, just go to gameanglia.co.uk, it's okay, it's quite easy in their mind. If I were to tell them, go to East, what was it? East England gamedev.org. Most people aren't going to remember that. Um, so that's why we we basically rebranded and got these domains. Right? Make sure that your com and .co.uk, especially since we're in England, uh, kind of like redirect to each other. It's not bad if they don't, but uh, it's not bad if you can't get both of them. Just be aware of that. And we also got the .org just, you know, just in case. You're at the party. Everybody from the games industry there is there. All of the big names. This guy is currently pitching his uh, game or his company for about two million dollars, right? He's doing his elevator pitch. It's like, oh yeah, my game is called, I don't know, uh, or my company is called East of England Game Developers Conference. And you're like, what? East of England Game Developers Conference is the same thing as with my Chris Phillip versus Radish Christian Kirita Phillip. Make sure that whatever name you get passes the bar test so you can actually get it recognized when there's a lot of ambient sound around because you'll most likely only have you know, one shot at actually talking to these people, especially if you're in, in, such an, in such an environment. Also, another one that's highly relevant now than it was five years ago is make sure that your name is recognizable by Siri or by Google Now or by Alexa because when somebody is going to be like, oh yeah, could you please, uh, Alexa, please wire $2 million to um, <laughs> Radesh Kiritsa, Alexa is going to be like, okay, I've wired $2 million to uh, Rares Chairit, which is, might be some, uh, somebody who's on the other side of the world. Right? So try, it's interesting to think about these because you, uh, you don't necessarily um, 
have these situations at the moment, but they're going to become more and more prevalent uh, down the line. So make sure that your company is future-proof from this point of view. And that can be, uh, that can be applied to your personal brand as well. Okay, so when you think about branding your company, think about your URL. These, uh, this is the website that you're going to be sending people to. So with Conga, which is the, current, uh, the company that I currently work for, we started with conga.io because conga.com uh, wasn't available. We then bought goconga.com, similar to Dropbox, which then turned out, uh, which then turned into conga.uk after negotiating with about a year for big amounts of money with the people who managed to get conga.uk. So please be careful with that. Make sure that once you choose your company name, it can pass a lot of these tests, like do I have a .com domain available? Do I have a .org or a .co.uk domain available? And if you don't, it's perfectly fine, you can do what Dropbox did and just, uh, or what we were trying to do here, which is just append or um, append a prefix or a suffix to it. This, this website called start.biz is a website which allows you to check companies house here in the UK to see if your your name has been used before it also checks quite a bit quite a few of the domain name providers just to make sure that and and that's a really easy one-stop shop if you want to check if a, if a name is available then you need to think about how you look like on social media as I was saying about almost a hero um, <coughs> we just chose the name and rolled with it we didn't do any checks beforehand which turned out to be a slight issue because almostahero.com was taken at almostahero uh, on Twitter was taken and they were taken by different people uh, and there's also a game called Almost a Hero luckily because of what we wanted to be which was a community of people we were able to buy the .club domain so we are almostahero.club and we're at almostahero.club which is really good and again this website here namechecker.com will tell you the availability of your name over multiple domains and multiple social media platforms. So if, you, if we would, would have used that, we would have seen that most of the options were, were taken. And this was made uh, particularly relevant when I tweeted, you know, my highlights were this, this, and this, and also the fact that I got to talk uh, about almost a hero to, um, to a few important people and I didn't tag almost a hero club I just tagged the first suggestion which I thought would be almost a hero club because you know I also own that account on Twitter but it tagged almost a hero which made that account be followed by Rami Ishmael which was which led to a quite interesting uh, situation however that's not the account that I really w uh, hoped that he would follow however it was quite funny and uh, you know any any sort of interactions like these like chance interactions tend to go a lot in the industry, uh, tend to go quite far in the industry. And lastly, think about Gmail. So for Game Anglia, we managed to get the Twitter, we managed to get the Facebook, we managed to get the Instagram, we managed to get the .com, .co, .uk, .org, and we were like, yes, everything's great, nobody check for Gmail. So at the moment, our Gmail address is gameangliaconference at gmail.com. Uh, and the reason why you want a separate Gmail uh, is because you will need at some point or another access to Google Docs unless you want to pay Google to host your G Suite. Okay, so for your game, things are quite easy. They're limited life products, so don't they won't live more than three years unless you're into Livebox or you're a company called Ubisoft. Um, it's perfectly fine to have really quirky names uh, that means social media handles, website names, and the reason for that is because it's increasingly hard to be easily remembered. And here's a list of all of the games which are showed at Res, which is a relatively small conference uh, in, in London, which happened last weekend. So I'll scroll through them. Oh, and there's also the Lectil collection. Okay, so that's, I think, about 200 games, 100 games, something like that. All of those had to go through all of those steps. 
So it, with games, especially since because of their limited lifespan, it's perfectly fine to go crazy uh, with your naming conventions. Um, after all, we all remember that uh, we all remember games such as <laughs> and ah. All right, so with your games, make sure that your game is good enough, and then all of the branding will follow. Now lastly, almost lastly, I want to talk about how to choose a name. Make sure that your name is descriptive. So there's, there's three ways of choosing a name, more or less. It's The first one is descriptive, so what exactly are you selling? What is the product about? So Dropbox makes you think about the box that you drop stuff in, which is mostly what people end up doing in the in the beginning of Dropbox. Facebook, right, book of faces. Um, then we have com composite words such as FedEx, Federal Express, Microsoft, really small software. And then one thing that I really haven't seen yet in the games industry, and I think it might actually be interesting to brand yourselves as this, uh, in terms of companies, is the names of the founders. So these are uh, legal counsels and um, and accountants in, in and around Ipswich, and they're literally the names of the people who set them up. So, you know, um, likey and likey, something like that, right? Things that people yeah, might be able to remember, and that way they're going to end up remembering yourself as well. Um, with this, what's also important to remember is it should have a purpose. So for example, if you name your game blue and it doesn't have any sort of relevance to the color blue or to any of the meanings of the color blue, it might not necessarily be interesting or memorable. However, if your name if you name your game blue and it has something to do with the way that the color blue is represented throughout media, that's going to be a lot more meaningful to, to your players and to the people who interact with your product or your company. Another way to think about names is to choose existing words, so real life words that are unrelated to the product. Things like apple, which is has nothing to do with apples in and of themselves. Things like conga, because at the moment we don't have anything to do with conga lines, but we might in the future. Things like buffer, which doesn't have anything to do with the buffering method or with the train buffers. Or things like valve. Oddly enough, they don't make plumbing instruments. They did use it for a logo. They did use it for a logo. They don't necessarily do anymore. Everybody kind of associates Valve with, with uh, Half-Life 3 and with Steam. But that's okay. Like uh, We're going to go into the logos in a bit. But they don't really have anything to, to do with the Valve as the instrument. Yeah. And if you're ever stuck for names, that website right there, video game, game nah, that me. Uh, is a video game name generator. Really crazy stuff. However, most of those things you'll be able to just quickly go and grab the .com domain for. And the last one, the last category is abstract names. Stuff like Google, or Bitly, or Zatu, or Zomato. Right? All of these are really abstract names. Don't, they don't really mean anything, but they can, uh, they can offer you the opportunity to give meaning to that word, right? Because we're all Googling things nowadays. Um, if you want to be able to come up with a name for your company or maybe for your game, that website right there, I'll, I'll share these slides with you so don't worry that you're not um, writing that in the URL. Um, that website right there can, can help you by giving you some hints and names which haven't been used yet. And another thing here, as I mentioned before, don't worry if you can't get the google.com domain. My Dropbox haven't been able to get Dropbox from the beginning. They're, they were get dropbox.com for quite a while. Uh, Steam is still steampowered.com. Um, and a tip is try it with a Z, because it tends to stick. Uh, it tends to stick in people's uh, people's heads a lot easier. You've chosen your name, you've chosen your website, you've made sure that it's Googleable, you've made sure that um, you have a Twitter handle for it. What next? You need a logo. With logos, you want them to be simple but easy to understand, and then you look at colors, and this could be a whole lecture in and of, the, in and of itself. However, what you need to think about is, and again, this also has to do with your games, because you want your games to kind of adhere to the same rules. 
how does it look like in RGB? So RGB is how it looks like on a computer screen. On any sort of LCD screen, you're going to be using the RGB hex code. However, when you're printing something, you're using the CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, um, which is slightly different. Um, it's a slightly different way of looking at colors when you're printing them. And you can sometimes have unpleasant surprises if you haven't thought about this from the beginning. And in Photoshop or in Illustrator, you can easily switch between RGB and CM CMYK just to see how things look like in those two systems. Another system which is re universally recognized is Pantone. And I recommend that if you're going to do things in a wide range of um, applications, things as fabric printing, right? They most likely won't have uh, RGB, but they will, they will likely have Pantone uh, colors. So this shirt was a Pantone color but it's not game angry or purple. You need to then think about how will my logo look like if it's monochrome, so if somebody uh, only prints it in black and white. So I'll put grays, grays here. At the same time, how does it look like uh, on a black background and on a white background? And because of this, with game Anglia, uh, because we also want it to be color bright friendly, and our logo needed to work in various sizes, um, that's actually a lot of our visual identity. So we not only have the game Anglia and the asterisk, we also have the asterisk um, as a separate item. And we also have game Anglia written in white, as you can see on my t-shirt as well, or in very dark gray. So we had we thought about all of these when we were designing the, the identity. And luckily, Jason was, was there um, and stood up to the case. Now in terms of various sizes, make sure that your logo can be easily printed on something that's about this big or on something that's as big as this screen. Because it might be that you suddenly decided that you wanted your logo to be the most elegant Japanese um, calligraphy uh, in the world with a lot of flourishes, but suddenly when it's half a centimeter, nobody can actually see what it is. And in terms of having it design, if you're a programmer and you don't really have that good of a um, that good of a graphic design knowledge, pay somebody ten quid to pay to, to design your logo. It, you're only going to pay them once, and you're going to end up with that logo using that logo for quite a bit of time. So it's a really good investment. And lastly, remember that no name is perfect. After all, how many of us really wanted the Virgin Experience days? <laughs> 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 or how many have decided to go go home and play with our Wii, and then four years later go play play with our Wii U? No name is perfect, and that applies to um, to the examples that I gave you earlier as well. So with my name, a lot of people spell it Chris Philip with a PH. So when I introduce my when I tell my name to somebody and they need to write it down. I'm like, it's Philip with an F, and they're like, okay, so where do I put the F? Um, and with Game Anglia, a lot of people pronounce it Games Anglia, because the Game Anglia flows a lot better than Game Anglia, because of the way that the consonant works uh, there, so we're most likely going to end up buying GamesAnglia.com as well, just in case. Um, but yeah, by all means, keep testing these, keep adapting them, and keep iterating them, and that was it, thanks. Thank you.